Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I see a few of you still trickling in, so we'll just let a couple of people come in here, but I think we're going to get started. Thank you for being here. My name is Jared Jingris. I'm the managing director and one of the analysts at uh, the analyst firm called The Real Story Group. And I have the unenviable task this morning to follow up a presentation about fantasy football with a pr presentation about selecting technology. Hopefully, we can think of it like drafting your ideal fantasy technology team, right? So it's, there's got to be some kind of parallels there. But specifically today, we're going to be talking about selecting the right video management technology. And I will put this into three main categories today. We'll start with giving you a little bit of perspective and, and some disclaimers. You know, I'll tell you a little bit about the lens through which I typically look, about, look at this, this word, world of video management technology and give you a couple disclaimers about um, some of the biases or, that I might have. Then we'll talk about the, the reason why I think there's a need for this session, and that's five traditional ways enterprise select technology. And then I'll tell you the, what I think is the better way to do it. Okay, so this is very much a how-to session where I'll go through a, a bunch of steps on, on how I think uh, there is the right way to, to select technology. But first, again, I want to give you a little bit of background, tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from. So at the Real Story Group, we're fundamentally an industry analyst firm. You may have heard of other industry analyst firms like Forrester and Gartner and whatnot. We're kind of like them, but we like to, to say we're more like the consumer reports of the, of the content technology space, okay? And so what we do is we evaluate vendors and their products on their strengths, and maybe more importantly to you as buyers, their weaknesses, okay? So people subscribe to our research, and, and, and that's really the, the foundation of what we do. Additionally, we do a little bit of consulting. Um, and, and we do very targeted, really three types of consulting engagements. We do technology audits, we do roadmaps and strategy projects. And what I'll be talking about today is really this last one, and that's product and vendor uh, selection projects. So people come to us say, hey, I know I need some new technology. Can you help us play matchmaker and get us the right technology and ensure we're going with the, the right option for what our unique needs are? Specifically, I mentioned we, we look at content technology. So what does that mean? These are all technologies that manage content through a life cycle from creation to hopefully an end of life at some point in time, or maybe no end of life. Maybe it's constant archiving. But we, we cover eight different marketplaces. If you were to divide these marketplaces up, the, the, we, we, we categorize them, them as digital workplace technologies, you know, technologies to manage content within the firewall, within your enterprise and digital marketing technologies, technologies uh, to, to get the right content to the right person at the right time outside of the firewall. But today, specifically, I'll be, I'll be stressing um, some, of the, some of the points that we've learned in our research from the, the digital and media asset management space that we cover. And I include this slide at, at the beginning of every, every presentation that we give, and, and that's just to, to, again, let you know where we're coming from. I'm going to be mentioning a lot of different vendor names and product names as I go through this presentation, and I need you to understand we don't work for the vendors that we cover. We don't advise them on their product strategy. We don't speak at their events. We don't write white papers for them. We don't take meals or any kind of other um, gifts from, from vendors. And this, what this allows us to do is we're not beholden to, their, to their, uh, the way that they're doing things and, and what their demands are. It, it might create a little bit of an adversarial relationship with them at some times, but we feel like that's the only way that we can truly give you as buyers the real story. And that's where our name comes from, and that's what we try to do. And this is something that we're very religious about, but quite frankly, we're very proud of it as a business model. All right, so with that as my background, Here's the gratuitous video's important slide. I say gratuitous because you're all, out, all here at Streaming Media West. You all know this, right? We all know that live streaming video and video in general is more important than ever. Um, that, that keynote this morning showed that people are consuming video at, at an enormous rate and doing so through a variety of devices that even surprise some of us. You know, I was certainly surprised to hear this morning the amount of video that's being consumed through Xbox and Apple TV um, versus you know, mobile device and tablets and, and whatnot. But there's a problem here. Our clients and our subscribers, we, we keep hearing some, some themes, and that is 
there's a, there's a real challenge of selecting the right technology. Um, now, there's a lot of companies and organizations out there selecting technology and doing certain parts of what they're, what they're trying to achieve very well, but they're running into a lot of roadblocks around the way, and, and particularly because there's a lot of overlapping capabilities around, among a lot of different marketplaces, even within the, the video realm, right? A lot of different uh, confusion, confusing terminologies and vendors saying that we're a, we're a, video, a, a video delivery solution and a video management solution, and, we, and some vendors saying we do everything, right? And so there's a lot of confusion there, and uh, we're seeing a lot of mistakes being made and, and the wrong technology being selected, a lot of money wasted before they figure out that it's the wrong technology, and that's what we want to try to avoid. So let's start out by saying, okay, this all seems obvious. Why are we, why are we doing this? What, what is causing these mistakes to be made within organizations? Well, we put it down into five different buckets of the way that enterprises traditionally go about selecting technology. Number one, this is what we like to call blind love. And I, I like to, to say this happens a lot at conferences like this. You come here with a particular challenge in mind. You might go out to the, the vendor uh, booths over there and you might see it sit in on some demos and you know what those demos always look really good right and they always say oh this is exactly what we need we need to go back and get this right without doing your your homework you're, you fall in love with one particular product who had a, maybe had a really good salesperson and maybe it's just not the right product at the end of the day but that's one way of, of selecting technology number two is what we like to call happiness is a warm set of binders and has anyone gone through an RFP process before where you've, you put together this laundry list of checklist requirements and you put it out in the street and say, hey, respond to my RFP? Well, what you get back looks something a little bit like this. You know, it's a, it's a lot of work that was done by the most junior person at the vendor who just cut and pasted what he did in the last time he responded to an RFP, and they send you back this huge document of which you're supposed to slog through and make sense of, um, of the key differences between the vendors that send all these back. Number three is the, uh, the My Cousin Vinny approach. And this is where, this can sometimes happen at conferences like this too, where hey, you, you meet an, a peer of yours here in the room and you say, hey, what are you doing to, 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 to handle your video uh, management needs? And someone says, well, this vendor worked great for us. It's kind of like this, you know, I got the guy just for you, right? And, uh, and what's, what happens there is you, you're, what you're not discounting is you have different organizations that have very unique needs that, that require very unique technology solutions. There's not, certainly not a one size fits all. Number four is what I like to call the family car approach. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first got my license, I was expecting to be able to step right into a new, a new car and I was expecting it to be red, but my car that I ended up first driving was something more akin to, to this, this little van here, which I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I should be lucky, I, I had a car, this, that was great. But this is how people end up with SharePoint in organizations today, I think. You, you, the business identifies a need, they say, they, they say we, we need to do this, they go to their IT department, IT department says, oh, well, we already have this, this CDN system, why don't you, I mean, this online video platform, why don't you use that for all of your enterprise video? You know, it, it basically does the same thing because we already have it. It's already in-house. It's there. It's easy. Number five is the horse race. You know, anyone ever been to a horse race? Well, when you first walk into the, into the, the track, they give you these little, these little sheets of paper that have, like, a couple sentences of background on the horse and they give you the odds and, and you're supposed to bet your hard-earned money based on that just a little bit of information. I'm going to pick on my... my, my peers in the analyst world, I feel like this is a little bit about how people use those, those things like the waves and the magic quadrants, where they just do a little bit of research and they say, oh, well, let's just look at the upper right-hand corner of this, of this quadrant and let's only consider those and, and, th and that's it. We'll just we'll pick, we'll pick the one at the top right. It sounds silly, but that's the way this technology is selected today. With each of these methodologies, what it really comes down to is you're guessing. Right? You're, not, you're not going through a rigorous process, so you're guessing, and this is what we want to avoid. So what we came up with, we think there's a better way to go about this selection process. We call it, we gave it the silly little name called the Real Story Vendor Procurement Process, or as we affectionately call it, the RSVP. Really what RSVP is, is six steps. 
six phases, with 20 steps, I should say, six phases of, of breaking this down. Now, we're gonna, I'm gonna take you through each of these steps and give you some examples of, of things you need to think about along the way. But fundamentally, there's a needs analysis phase, there's a scenario development phase, which may be the most critical of them all, there's a market analysis phase, there's an RFP or tender phase, as it might be known more in, in, on the European side of the, the pond. Um, there's a demo and proof of concept phase and ultimately a selection phase. So if we were to break it down, I mentioned it's 20 phases, it's 20 steps. You don't have to do all 20 steps. The goal of this methodology is, it, is for it to be agile enough to modify it to your organization, but the most successful projects that we see are the organizations that give consideration to all 20. You know, you have to be thinking about all 20 steps. So I'm going to take you through, and let's start with needs analysis. What I'm talking about here is fundamentally articulating the business case at some level, identifying the right stakeholders who need to be involved, establishing a governance model, gathering your requirements, and then being honest with yourself about your risk, your own risk and maturity. So I mentioned you can skip certain steps. You don't have to do them all. But the one that we highly recommend that you do not skip is the, is the business case. You need to articulate the business case. And that may seem completely obvious, but let me tell you a story. Just a few weeks ago, we got a call from a, a potential client who said, Jared, I want, you, I want you and Real Story Group to come in and help us build the business case. I said, oh, great, this is, this is fantastic. That's, that's the kind of project we like to do. We like to get it in for, at, at the beginning stages. H how much work have you done so far? Well, here's the thing. We just finished the implementation. So you're writing the business case now? Yes. But unfortunately, that's not a, a unique story. This is a, it's kind of a, a typical thing that we keep seeing over and over again when Projects like this aren't articulated appropriately within an organization. At the end of an implementation project, go figure, some things might not go so well during an implementation project, and expectations at the, upon delivery might not meet expectations of certain leadership within the organization. And so that leads to a lot of finger pointing. So typically people think of the business case as, okay, we need to prove that this is worth it, right? We need to do the math from a, from a financial standpoint. But you can't discount the, the value you get from a business case when it, in terms of really communicating the plan. Being honest with yourself, should we do this? Is it the right, right approach for us? And then this is your first, your first change management step where you're starting to get people on board and get everyone on, uh, understanding of what it is you're trying to accomplish and then what it is you're going to use to measure that success. If you do that up front, you're going to be a lot, your chances of success are going to be a lot greater. I use the expression, you want to be honest with yourself. And that's the biggest thing about doing a, doing a business case for me. A lot of the time, the biggest hidden audience of the business case is yourself. And Quite frankly, when it comes to the technology that we're talking about today, most enterprises overbuy rather than underbuy. You know, I, I like to use this, this little silly example that, you know, when you have this pile of dirt in your lawn, it's pff, the, the best thing for you to move it around your yard is probably something like this wheelbarrow, but what people end up doing is they buy that. Right? And so, can it do the job? Yeah, sort of. Is it the best tool for the job? Probably not. In that example I gave about how not to select technology, I gave the example of the, the warm set of binders, right? Anyone been through an RFP process before? Anyone's RFPs look a lot like this? It's a big Excel spreadsheet of, of, um, of requirements. We like to say, don't do this. Do not make checklists of requirements the bulk of your RFPs. Now I understand that certain industries among you will have the certain things that you have to have. There's just some must requirements that you need to check off, maybe some security requirements that you need to fulfill. That's fine. But I want the bulk of your RFPs to be scenario-based. And by scenario-based, I mean I want you to tell a story. I want them to be narrative in nature, and I want you to really paint a picture of what, it may, what you're trying to do and what makes your situation unique. Okay. I know this is, this, is not, this is very hard to read from the back of the room. I'm not expecting you to read it in detail. It's just an example. As opposed to going through those checklists of requirements, paint the picture. So 
really explain how people are going to interact with the system, you know, really use real actors, represent real roles, represent real environments, whether it's, you know, location or um, tech, uh, systems that they might be interacting with, give real process examples and real functionality that you're trying to, trying to accomplish, and real workflows. By doing this, it's a little bit of art and science in, to, to create these, though, because you want to be uh, descriptive enough without being overly prescriptive. But we talk to vendors all the time that tell us, I love getting this kind of RFP. It, it, it helps me so much to understand if we are truly a good fit, because we really understand what it is these people are trying to do. So if you make these the bulk of your RFP, again, it helps your team understand what you're looking for, it helps the vendors, and it makes for a much more meaningful conversation as you go through this process. We're going to get back to those scenarios, but next, the third step in this process is the market analysis. And as, industry, as an industry analyst, this is, this is really our world, right? We're constantly analyzing the marketplace. But as a buyer, I can imagine it can be very confusing. A couple reasons is when we talk about video in particular, we have a lot of web content management systems out there who are claiming that they're, they're the solution to publish video out onto the internet. We have a lot of digital asset management systems who are fundamentally really good at, at managing still uh, images, but recognize the need for the ongoing, the, the increasing amount of video and say, well, we can manage video as well. And they're not lying, they just don't, there's a lot of limitations there, they don't do it great. Then we have this whole slew of technologies called media asset management systems who handle more longer form video. Then we have CDNs to help the delivery of video. We have online video uh, platforms, uh, things to, to help, help deliver the video over the web specifically. And we have enterprise video platforms, and we have a whole set of video production technologies. So lots of technologies, but the tricky part is the overlaps. There's a lot of, a lot of common functionality that are being offered among, among these, these marketplaces, and it can be very confusing about which direction to turn. So when you're trying to put together that short list, about who to send an RFP to, what we're seeing is a lot of mismatch shortlists. You know, we're seeing the, uh, a media asset management being put up, a system being put up against a, a web content management system being put up against a, 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 an OVP. Really, really mismatch, and that's just a waste of time. If you can get a shortlist of really like contenders, then you're, then you're actually um, comparing apples to apples in this process, and that's where the real value of, of, of going through this is. So we have some examples, you know, as we break down what, the, what vendors are, are the players in these, uh, in these categories, and I see many of you taking some pictures. I'll be happy to give any of you any, any of these slides. You know, there's, there's a lot of detail coming up, and, and you're, you're more than welcome to have them and, and, and go forth, use them as you'd like. But, some big names in the, in the broadcast world. Um, corporate video management is a different flavor that, that we talk about a lot. Video production and distribution, and then the whole CDN and OVP world. Lots of players, lots of big names, big name vendors, and lots of small best of breed vendors. So, you, you know, you, among this list of vendors, you have vendors who are trying to be everything to everyone and have a lot of marketing dollars to to make that case. But when push comes to shove, I think you'll really find they're probably good at one or two things and really lag in other areas, and we'll talk more about that. But let's get into this confusion. One of the most confusing thing right now is this notion of OVPs, online video platforms, versus enterprise video platforms. And fundamentally, there's a lot of similarities. And again, I mentioned this is where the lines get blurred. There's really a t three tiers of, of functionality that th these vendors are, are offering. And if you break it down, there's the content creation piece, of which might be real-time or recorded or ingested or even user-generated. Then you have the, the fundamental content management piece. And once, the, once the content is in a system, here's your lifecycle capabilities. Here's your, your editing. Here's your, the workflows that it might go through. Here's the metadata and the smart uh, intel, intelligence that you're applying to, to the different content. Your analytics, and then you're probably integrating with another system. And then finally, is it, there's the whole delivery piece, getting it to the right person at the right time, whether it's um, on one platform, multi-platforms, 
there's a whole slew of video players that, that you need to think about from a, from a hardware standpoint. And then, of course, caching and performance um, and, and rights and security. So one of the ways that we try to, to try to make some sense of this is to start to break down which scenarios are these technologies really good at. Okay, so I, it's really tempting for us to just try to draw boxes around different vendors, and we do as analysts. That's that's part of what we're trying, what we're doing here. But we, we find that if we start to say, okay, if P, if you are trying to do executive communications like town hall type meetings within your enterprise, you're probably going to look at an enterprise video platform. If you are trying to to do more content marketing based video or advertising and branding, or e-commerce stuff, you're probably going to look at the online video platform, the OVP, and so. I mention these scenarios because we do our rankings on the suitability to each of these technologies that we cover at, with regards to each of these scenarios. We give them ratings and we say, this product was fundamentally built to handle this scenario. Or this product can do this, but it's going to take a lot of work on your part. Do you want questions now or later? Yeah, shoot them out. What if you have a hybrid? Uh, absolutely. In, in, in some cases, there are some vendors who are trying to be both things to both both people. Now, it, I have seen it work where you have, you can use one technology for both, but I've also seen it, there's a really good case to, do, to get, to use separate systems for those, for those use cases. And I, I'd have to learn more about your situation, but that's a perfect example of making sure you identify all your use cases and testing their suitability, because you're probably going to, in most cases, as a general statement, you're not going to get the same mileage if you're trying to do both with one, with, with one, uh, one tool. So here's some of the players in the, um, the EVP category. Um, interestingly enough, this is one of, the, one of the areas that it's a blend of software and hardware in many cases. So there's a whole slew of systems that will, will sell you both. Then there's a whole, a whole slew of systems that will just provide the software, and then you need to find some hardware to help you deliver it. Um, typically, though, what we're finding is that among these, people want the end-to-end -end process that you know, we talked about those three tiers. They want everything from production to management to delivery. And very few vendors are really good at giving you everything. And so what it, what's happening is, is enterprises are finding themselves having a core product, but then supplementing it with other pieces and building, again, we go back to that fancy football analogy. You really are building together, building your toolkit and, and picking the right, the right pieces to, uh, to fulfill your, your team. From an external perspective, I'm sure you're familiar with some of these, some of these names out here. Um, these typically are better end-to-end -end because the, in often cases, it's a much simpler use case, right? It's, it's about delivering content to your, to your end, end users over the, over the web. There's a, there's a split. Um, there's actually some, some open source options here and some commercial options. I've, many of these guys are, are out in the, in the room. I'm sure you can, you can see some of those. Um, but they tend to be simpler in nature, and I think that's why you can get more of the end-to-end. -end. But again, if you are trying to make sense and, and figure out which direction you should lean towards, drive your evaluations off of scenarios. So here's the scenarios, the, the, really the eight scenarios that we tend to look at when we, when we do these. And you are likely to fall into multiple scenarios, but probably not all of the scenarios. And, I, and, and likewise, there are vendors out there who are probably good at one or two of these scenarios, but no one's good at all of the scenarios. And that's, and that's what you really need to do some testing there. So the next step is really to look at this media asset management space. So I mentioned you know, we have this, this other overlapping Two, two marketplaces. We have digital asset management who are born out of the, the still images and, and brand assets. And then you have your, your more sophisticated broadcast um, t type long form video management tools. And they would seem like they're separate, but they, they definitely, their lines definitely blur as well. So we call these our, our logo landscapes. And again, as analysts, we're trying to, to, to put boxes around the like products. Um, but the the message here is that you have a number of options, a number of different licensing platforms, and a number of different costs. These, 
these really range in prices from from f open source or logically uh, nominally free to you know millions of dollars on the on the other end. So there's a real there's a real uh, blend there, and there's a real opportunity to to go off in, into the wrong direction if you're not careful. And if you if this is what you're what you're looking at, this again we 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 encourage you to uh, identify your scenarios. When it comes to this space. There's really seven different scenarios that we uh, identified. You have more of the, the television news type scenario versus the sports broadcasting, um, versus government type um, asset management to corporate asset management to feature length asset management. And again, if this is what you're looking at, dig in, see which vendors are, have, the, have the best ratings, build your short list, and then get into the details. Too often I see organizations d drive right towards the, the real technical requirements of these systems. And we do this type of ratings on, on all, of our, all of the vendors that we cover. We get to this level of detail. But the key is here, don't start here. Right? Use those high-level scenarios to, to self-identify, OK, this, this is what we're trying to do. Get your short list, then do your, your due diligence and get to this level of detail. Other things you want to think about? at this point in the process is what kind of technology are, do you have an appetite for? Are you looking to, to have this uh, installed on premise in your organizations? Would you consider a hosted model or consider a hybrid of, of, of both? What's the licensing model? Is it open source? Is it traditional uh, licenses? What other hardware is, is required? This is another one that, that gets to trip organizations up when they think they can just get the software when in fact sometimes they need to supplement that with, with hardware. Integration is always a critical piece here, um, you know, but this is a perfect example of, of one of those requirements where everyone says it needs to be able to integrate with X. What does integrate really mean? Integrate mean, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, so that's a perfect example of something you want to spec out in a, in a scenario form to describe that integration, how, what kind of content or uh, workflows will be uh, across multiple systems. Think about mobile support and how sophisticated your, your, your analytics need to be. These are often, or analytics in particular, is something that people forget about in the beginning stages of a technology project, but it's something that they really want at the end, and they say, oh gosh, we should, really should have given more, more thought to that earlier. So the fourth step in our, in our process is, is the RFP step. And again, I, I think people that, people say, I hear this all the time, well, isn't RFPs the old way of doing this? Is this still relevant to people? Isn't that old fashioned to do an RFP? Well, you gotta get the, go to market somehow. So I've seen people go right to a, skip the RFP and go right to an RFD, and that's fine, but the process should be similar. Um, but what people really don't like about the, the traditional RFP process is those checklists. I, I have to believe that. And, Here's where I want you to make those scenarios the bulk of your RFP, get the vendors to say, here's how my solution will, will meet your unique scenarios, and then we're going to take those scenarios right through the rest of this process. We're going to have them come in and demonstrate um, through custom, demo, custom demos rather than their cam demos, and then use the scenarios again in a, in a set of head-to-head -head pilots. Anyone ever sat through a demo week from vendors where you have a bunch of demo, uh, vendors come in and, and, and give their demonstrations? Yeah, it remind you like this? I mean, hopefully you're, you're all there. This, this presentation reminds me of this. No, I, you can, it's okay, it's okay. Um, but I've sat in a lot of these demos and, and I find myself very much in, in, in the middle there with, uh, with my clients all around me saying, this is, this is a waste of time. Unless you do the demos the right way. It is such a waste of time if you give the vendors the, the ability to just come in and, and dictate what they're going to show you. Because what they're going to show you is going to look really slick, really impressive, and have very little other value, unfortunately. It's a waste of their time. It's a waste of your time. What we need you to do is get them to demonstrate your scenarios and then structure your week in a way that you have vendor A, vendor B, and vendor C 
all demonstrating the same scenarios in the same order, really structure it in a way that they're not coming in, doing introductions, giving you PowerPoint, get right into the weeds, show them how this system, how this system is gonna work for you, and then use that time that you, that you might have spent looking at their, their corporate history and, and ask the tough questions, especially around pricing. Ask about which pieces are included in their, in their proposal and which pieces are, are extra. And just constantly be aware as you go through this, where you're trying to assess the scenario fit, the technology fit. You wanna understand how well of a fit they are as a partner. And we find that doing those custom, custom scenarios and custom demos, you learn a little bit about the partner because you, you get to see how willing are they to adapt to our needs. And you know, we're the, we're the technology analysts, we're constantly talking about technology, but I can't stress enough the importance of finding the right partner in addition to the right technology. And then also, the value fit. No one here has an unlimited amount of money to spend on technology, and so you need to find a partner that's a good fit from a, from a value standpoint as well. And I'd like to talk about that next, because this is a big mistake that I see happening over and over and over again. If you look at our process, our 20 steps here, typically when people start negotiating, even in the best intention companies, the companies that have done all these steps, all 18 steps, they do it after they make the decision on which, which vendor they're going to go with, right? I mean, it's a logical spot for it. However, vendors are smart and their salespeople are very savvy. If they go through this process for weeks on end and you, then you start negotiating, they got you. And they know they got you because they know you've invested all this time and effort and, you don't, and if you've winnowed, winnowed, winnowed your options down, they're going to be much less likely to negotiate at that point. So what we recommend is you start negotiating after you get the proposals back. Because here's the, here's the time when they've had a chance to go through your scenarios, they've learned more about you in your situation, you've learned about them and what they're, what they're proposing um, as, as a solution to those challenges. And so at this point, this question is going back and forth and you should start refining your, your, that proposal from a price perspective. You should continue it and immediately um, in the, in the on-site demos. Again, ask those tough questions, which, what's included, what's not included, and that's the big one. Um, and then as you get to a, to a proof of concept phase where you have some finalists, you continue that negotiation and you make it really clear that price is going to be a part of your decision, as it should be, and then finally make your decision. And, and at this point, you've been working towards a contract all along and it's, and it's a less, uh, it, let's just say it's a, it's a smoother process if you, if you do this and, you, and by the time you're, you're ending, you, you feel like you're all on the same page as opposed to being, uh, dealing with a, a situation where it's very, uh, there's a lot of animosity and saying, okay, we've been through this and now you're saying it's gonna cost what? And you're, and you're basically starting from scratch. You wanna keep the value uh, piece involved throughout the whole process. So the final step is the, the, when you're actually making your final decision, we always recommend that you do what we call some people might call a bake-off, or what it really fundamentally is, is a competitive proof of concept, okay? This is where you get your, final, your two finalists and you mimic a real project as much as possible. So you, again, we wanna reuse those scenarios that we wrote at the beginning and actually have the, team, the, the vendor come in and build out several of those scenarios. Really replicate, um, your processes, maybe the, the blend of, of, of people that might be working on this implementation project, whether they're your people, whether they come from the vendors themselves, and maybe a third party integrator. Try to mimic that, that team structure. Use real content if you can, real, real assets, real people in a, in, a, in a real environment. The most successful projects that we've ever seen, the most successful selection projects across any technology that we've worked with are the, are the companies that take the time to do this right. I know we have 20 steps in my, pro, in my, in my selection process and they all have value, but it's not until you, your, you and your team actually get your hands on the technology, put your own content through the, through the processes, understand what the screens are like to, to work with, and understand what it's really like to work with the people from the vendor as well. That's when you, you learn, the, learn the most lessons here. 
And so we always say, yes, it can be expensive, it can be time consuming, but what's the cost of a failed implementation? So what I've tried to show you today is a, is a little bit different way of, of going about a selection. So the, the traditional approach is at the top here where you spend a lot of time up front doing, doing requirements gathering, then you go to your RFP proposals demos, then you go to your project initiation where you're doing some more detailed requirements and specs, and then you do your big bang implementation. What we're saying is be a little bit more agile and iterative and spend a little bit less time up front on requirements start to build some insight as to what your, your descriptive scenarios will be, put a lot of time in your RFP proposals and demos where you're testing, 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 and then the biggest test is the bake-off, which should transition right into a, your live pilot, because you can certainly reuse what you did in the bake-off, and then go into a phased implementation. So more value, more lessons delivered deliver earlier in the process as to finding out the important things la later in the process where you've already devoted a lot of time. So let's finish up with some takeaways. So the vendors can be divided up into a, a, a number of different categories, but you have to be careful here because there's a lot of overlap. Don't ignore the different tiers of vendors that exist out there and make sure you're comparing apples and apples as you put together your short list. The use case emphasis should, will undoubtedly, or should undoubtedly trump the functional capabilities analysis. Figure out what these systems were built to do, what are they fundamentally good at, and if that's what you're trying to do, then that's probably a good fit for you, or a good, at least a, a good shortlist fit. And then test. We have to, if the whole thing that I want you to take away from today is that there's a, this is a winnowing down process based on testing. Testing at every single step along the way. Avoid get the guessing and you want to have that increasingly uh, more intimate set of interactions with your vendors so that by the end of the process you're very confident in, in, in what, you're, what you're getting into. Never underestimate the amount of services that it come in, into play with any of the technologies we talked about. People get into trouble thinking that they're just buying software here, when in many cases, unfortunately, it's, it's kind of sad, but we've seen that you're going to spend mul many multiples on services to implement the technology than, than you are on their license costs in, in, in many cases. And that's something that is very rarely budgeted up front and often comes as a very shocking surprise at the end, and, and that's certainly something that you want to, to avoid. And then do your homework. You know, really, don't just, don't just take the vendor's word for what they're, what they're selling is going to be a, a, a solution to your needs. Get out there, do your research, and, do your, and make sure you, you customize these tests to your unique needs so that you're absolutely certain that, that you're getting what you need. With that, I'll take some questions. I encourage anyone to, if they want to reach me, feel free to shoot me an email. My email's up there. If you want to get a sense of what our research looks like, go on our website, download a free chapter. We get, you get the whole chapter. You'll get a sense of, of what it is that, that we do and, and kind of the, the analysis that, that we go through. Uh, but with that, I'll ask, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, <laughs> so the question is, you're, the fundamental nature of, of our process is to get them to make the right decision, like the right partner decision, but you're asking are there other benefits that they get from going through these steps? Yeah, I, so I'm, I think there's a lot to be learned from there, and I, you know, I'll start, I think you, what, what ends up happening is the organizations that we work with learn a lot more about themselves and, and their, their real capacity for handling the, the type of technology that they're getting into at every step of the way. They, and, and they're able to, to flag different issues such as, okay, we need to staff up in a certain area, we don't have the, the capabilities to handle this technology. Um, or we, you learn a lot about your own content along the way where you, you might say, okay, we, this, is, this is great and th all this technology will help us meet our needs, but we need to do a lot of work to get our content ready for that. You know, maybe it's not, our content isn't structured correctly, maybe it doesn't have the right metadata on it. 
Um, you learn a lot of lessons there. You learn a lot about your internal processes. You know, the, old, the way things have always been done might not be the best way to do, to do things. Um, you, you, you certainly learn a lot there. And then you learn a lot about, or the, there can be a lot of value in, in that financial piece that I mentioned. You know, I think in many cases when organizations go through this process, really put an emphasis on, on the financial piece, doing that early, they save a lot of money. And, you know, it seems like a lot of a very rigorous process, and it is. And people say, I don't have the appetite for that. But the, pe the people that do it right end up saving it, saving it, um, saving money, and, and paying for, basically paying for this this due diligence. Thank you. Oh, sure. So I'm from an IT department where often uh, the business folks come and and start at the end and say, I want this one. Yep. Uh, do you have any advice, uh, because we do a lot of the checklists, which is what the business people want to do, mm -hmm. so do you have any advice on getting people, the, the larger group of stakeholders, to adopt a method like this, rather than just, I picked this one because I saw it in an airline magazine and I think it's the best, and so now you have to implement it. Yeah, All right, so w we actually find ourselves in the middle of many of those IT business relationships, let's say. And we, we're, we're, we've, I feel like we're like the, the psychologists in many cases. And like, sit down on the couch, we're gonna work this out. But uh, I would challenge you know, your organizations to, to think about how you go about your processes when, when, you're, when you're embarking on new IT efforts. Because the old way of doing things was, you know, the business would come up with an idea, they'd flesh it out, and then they'd kind of throw it over the wall to IT, and IT would run with it, right? And so you have to have a set of requirements that, that facilitate that handoff. What I would challenge you to do, and, and this is a trend happening across the board, so it's, it's n nothing crazy I'm going to say here, but you have to get your IT and business people working together earlier in the process, right? They, where we find a lot of value here is when those, we write those scenarios, we don't do it just with the business or just with the IT, you do it with both. You get them fully invested at the beginning. Now, in the, in the marketing world, you know, this, there's this notion of the, the marketing technologist who you know, IT people are actually physically sitting with, with the marketing people in many cases, and, and they're very much collaborating on these projects from the, from the outset. Um, that's, a, that's certainly a trend. And then one more trend I'll just throw out there is maybe in many cases you need to stop thinking of these as projects. Typically what we're seeing in many cases is the move from think about everything as an IT project but thinking about your technologies as products in and of themselves. So your products have sort of this, this care and feeding, that it's ongoing care and feeding where the business is constantly working with IT, growing with your technology as opposed to we're doing a project, we pick the technology, it's gonna sit here for 10 years, everyone's gonna hate it, we're gonna blame IT, we're gonna start this process again and maybe, maybe we're, gonna, we're gonna try to avoid what we did last time so now we're gonna go look on the web and f download something and just see if we can avoid IT. It's just the process is a little bit broken there but I, I, I see there's a lot of companies who are being much more proactive about getting these people together early in the process, and that's helping, certainly. Yes, sir. I'm just wondering about the, kind of the general guidelines as far as timelines of mm. aging this whole process. What's, what's the, what gets you seen at that? Yeah. Yeah, so usually people ask me the typical, and I, and I say there really isn't a typical. Um, but the, quick, the quickest I've seen it done is about three weeks. But that's not for every technology, right? I mean, we're talking about if you were selecting a an online video platform, could you do it in three weeks? Maybe, I mean, that's pushing it, right? I mean, you, you gotta write your scenarios and get people to come in and demonstrate. You're probably gonna skip some steps along the way to get it done that fast, and I don't recommend that. Um, the longest, I mean, sometimes these things take years. I mean, if you're talking about a, an enterprise video platform for a 400,000 employee organization across every country in the world, it's gonna take time, right? Um, but if I were to say typically, it, you're probably looking in the uh, three to five month time frame. De again, it really depends on the complexity of what you're trying to do and the technologies that you're looking at. 
But if the, one more point on that, oftentimes we're recommending that you drag it out because the mistakes where mistakes are made is if you rush it and you skip your steps, you do you you sacrifice some due diligence and and uh, if you if you can stretch it out, typically that's a better a better decision will be made in the long run. Okay. Anyone else? Um, I'll be around if anyone wants to chat. I know it's right before lunch, um, or I think we have a break, but take one more question and yes. Your PowerPoint's really well done. Is it available online right It will be, and, and if, but I, the best way to do it is if you want to just give me your card, I'll send you it personally and we'll get it to you as soon as possible. Okay? Thank you all for your attention. I appreciate it, and I look forward to chatting. Thanks.